Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ed Fisher. I am the new uh, Assistant Vice President for Community and Government Relations here at American University. Uh, thank you for being here this morning for the High Impact uh, Research Conference for 2019. Uh, I'm a native Washingtonian, so today we're going to hear a lot about what happens here in D.C., so it's a, it's a special panel for me this morning to hear about the work for, that you guys are all doing here uh, in my hometown of Washington. So I'm going to quickly go through introductions of our panelists, and then I'm going to let them get started with their uh, presentations. Uh, with us today we have Mike Alonzo, Assistant Professor of Department of Environmental Science. Uh, a lot of his work focuses on urban ecosystems. We have Michael Bader, Associate Professor of Sociology and Public Administration and Policy. Uh, a lot of his work focuses on the D.C. area survey that digs into local neighborhood social, political, economic crime and health conditions. We have uh, with us uh, Sonia Greer, Professor of the Department of Marketing. A lot of her work researches and investigates the relationship between marketing activities and consumer health with a focus on obesity. Mr. Daniel Kerr, Associate Professor, Department of History. Uh, some of his work focuses on the impact of homelessness in cities like Washington, D.C. And we have Benjamin Stokes, Assistant Professor, School of Communications and the AU Game Lab uh, as a civic media scholar and game designer uh, who will be teaching a course called Who is D.C. this fall. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike Alonzo and let you get started. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh-oh. Um, uh <laughs> Enable. Uh, it's not on my screen, so how do I get rid of it? Just keep moving the mouse over. I can't see that. It's stuck here. Keep going. Or control F8 in order to enable the screen I'm going to see. Ooh. Savant. <laughs> All right, sorry about this. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, there we go. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, okay. All right, that works. Okay. Okay, so uh, I haven't done, I, I'm, I'm sort of a bookended by research in D.C., I guess, as in I, uh, when I first got to D.C. in 2006, I, I was coming off of being a healthcare consultant, and the only reason that's relevant is because that meant that I was traveling to every week to some uh, kind of unpleasant city around the country, sleeping in hotels, and never interacting with a particular place beyond the Marriott like buffet. <laughs> so when I quit that job and came to DC, I was like, I want to fully engage with the city and be really local and ride my bike around and all that stuff. So I got a job at Casey Trees, the urban forestry nonprofit in town, as their GIS specialist. GIS is like computer mapping, geographic information systems. And so it was partly, um, you know, it was basically working in support of their efforts to restore, enhance, and protect the tree canopy of D.C. And uh, so I did a lot of stuff, but uh, what led into my more research and, and kind of got me interested enough to go back for a Ph.D. was doing these uh, studies where they go to 200 different field plots around the city. So those are all those dots on that map are randomly dropped field plots that um, could be intersecting like six or eight people's lawns. They could be on Secret Service property. One of them was on Marine One's landing pad. So they're all over DC. You go out to these places, ideally, if you can get access and you measure the, the health and species composition and the, the sizes of all the trees in order to get a sense of what you have in your city as a precursor to being able to say, you know, make broad statements about uh, tree health and canopy amounts and all that stuff. So obviously it was difficult to do that in an urban area and more than half the time is spent getting permission to do this stuff. So that led me into, okay, what am I gonna do for research to make this easier? So you can go to the next slide. And uh, I won't go, there's a, can you hover over that? Maybe that's a video. Yeah, there's a playbook no. down here. 
Sorry, I see it. Got corner. it. Got it. So let's. How much can we make these measurements from above? So I won't talk about the specifics of what I did PhD in, but it related to measuring species and. Um, Sorry, I can't find it. Species and size of trees. But fast forward to what I'm doing now back in DC, because that, that work was in Santa Barbara. And what you're seeing here, even, oh, there we go. <clears throat> this is a CubeSat. So these are this new generation of small satellites that are cheaper, a lot cheaper to launch. And they come in like flocks or constellations where there's a bunch of them going around in orbit at the same time, which allows for cheaper gathering of really high resolution data. So like. Think of Google Maps style satellite imagery where you can see the buildings and the trees individually. Um, and then think of being able to look at the same tree uh, once a week for every week. And what's, so what happens to that tree on a week by week basis? We can now measure uh, because of this sort of technology. So that's what I'm working on right now. And maybe go to the next slide to show kind of why. So this is called uh, phenology, which just means like lifestyle, uh, or excuse me, a life cycle of plants, basically. So uh, it's important to understand how tree species are changing, or trees are changing week by week as like an indicator of climate change, for example. So when do the leaves come out? You might probably know it in terms of the cherry blossoms. When do the cherry blossoms come out? When is the peak going to be? When are the blossoms going to fall off and the leaves are going to come out? All of that's interesting in DC for that particular reason, but it's interesting everywhere as a way to monitor local and broader changes to the climate and species, tree species response to that. So if you can image that every week, you can assess like, is our oak trees reacting differently than maple trees to climate stressors? So. What you're seeing here is a, a, a typical satellite imagery uh, image, which doesn't give you much information in a city. It does the pixel sizes are too big. Over there are the better than this newer CubeSat style imagery that gives you a lot more information and allows for this work. Um, go ahead. This I. This is just a, a, a plot of basically a single tree over time in a single season, getting more and more leaves on it, getting into the summer, and then losing its leaves at the end of the year. And what we're looking at is, are there shifts in the timing of when that happens, when the leaves come on and when they fall off? So this is my interaction with DC. It gets students out there to uh, validate this data with actual, you know, just regular cameras on the ground. We'll go out and take measurements with uh, just other sensors to kind of validate whether the greenness that we're measuring from a satellite is real or whether it's a product of like atmospheric interference or some other phenomenon. Um, <clears throat> we will eventually start going out with a bunch of air, we'll distribute air temperature monitors throughout the city uh, in order to say, is, are these changes in timing of leaf emergence due to local changes in air temperature? Um, so I guess kind of in summary, a lot of the on the ground work has yet to be done, but I have experience that I can speak to more from the Casey Tree standpoint of uh, doing biophysical measurements in cities is more about interacting with people and getting permission to do stuff <laughs> and making sure your equipment doesn't get stolen than the actual measurements themselves. So it's at least 50 50. So I will leave it at that. Okay. Great. Thank you. That's early farm, if anyone's. <laughs> Another place that I work. Gotcha. All right. Um, thank you for that. And we're going to do questions uh, in just a, when we get to the end, but I'm going to let Mike go. And All right. So I'm the second Mike. This is something that <laughs> we've gotten used to over our lives. Um, but um, I want to thank you all for being here. And I want to talk today about the DC area survey, which is something I've been working on for about five or six years now. Um, and wanted to emphasize two things. One, that it's an ongoing research project, so if there's things that you're interested in, please let me know, but also that we have two rounds of data already collected, so if you're interested in survey research, to please um, let me know. And we, um, so let me describe the survey a little bit. You can go to the next slide. Um, so these are, this is the uh, team that's involved so far, and actually there's a few more people. This was from an older slide. Uh, I pulled the wrong year. 
Um, but so it's about a dozen people, a little bit over a dozen people now that are involved in the project across AU. Um, if you can go to the sure. next slide. Um, basically what we're trying, and the next one. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. And basically what we're trying to do is get surveys of uh, people in the Washington DC area to understand how they, um, how satisfied and how they feel about their neighborhoods, how they feel what, about um, race and immigration, how they feel about politics, how they feel about um, their health and crime and safety. And so basically this reflects a lot of the uh, research interests of those of us on the team, but also kind of broader um, conditions that we're interested in trying to measure over time. And just like Mike was interested in measuring the same places uh, in the biophysical sense, we're interested in kind of the social sense and how the DC area is changing. And one of the things that we have really tried to emphasize is that um, if you really want to understand the district, it's, it's impossible to understand the district on its own, but you really need to understand the DC area. And, and um, part of this is from growing up in, the, in Montgomery County instead of the district. Um, so I, I grew up here, uh, so it's, it's, it's special to be able to study this area. <coughs> but if we're interested in things like inequality, um, Poverty is actually increasing in the suburbs, especially in Prince George's County and in parts of Montgomery County, um, rather than in the district where things are tending um, often in the opposite direction with gentrification and other forces. And so if we're interested in inequality, understanding just the district is insufficient. So we, what we do is we sample not just the district, but all of the dr jurisdictions that touch the district as well. So Montgomery County and Prince George's County in Maryland, Arlington, Fairfax County in uh, Virginia, as well as the city of Alexandria, which is an independent city, which is where you think the Mid-Atlantic has that nowhere else has in the country. Um, so, um, and so we've fielded two surveys so far. Um, one was in 2016, in, in October 2016, um, and we re uh, received back, basically what we do is we sample households randomly. We work with a survey research firm to send it out to households, and we get back those responses. And so we're able to make a representative, we're able to use statistics to represent the entire um, DC area. Um, in the first round, we actually focused on two types of neighborhoods. We focused on multi-ethnic, what I have called in some of my work, quadrivial neighborhoods, which means four paths coming together, which is uh, neighborhoods that are at least 10% black, white, Latino, and Asian, and no group is a majority. Um, and you can go to the next slide. And so this is a map of where those are, the, the dark areas are. Um, Quadrivial neighborhoods in, in the in the DC area, so you can see them kind of up here. Um, these are the metro stops, um, and so you can see them kind of along the, the transportation corridors. Um, and then the other uh, group of neighborhoods that we sampled were disproportionately Latino neighborhoods, which were neighborhoods which were at least 10% Latino, and um, I'm sorry, at least 25% Latino, and no group was majority of. I mean, I'm sorry, and not already a quadrivial neighborhood. I'm getting the two definitions mixed up. Um, so, um, and then if you go to the next slide, and what we've done in each of the surveys is ask about a whole range of issues. Um, so my own research is, is understanding how uh, neighborhoods, how people are satisfied with neighborhoods and how that um, leads to changes over time in neighborhood composition. So if you think about white flight, oftentimes what I find is that's not so much what happens now as, long as, as much as this kind of long-term gradual turnover between white neighborhoods to becoming more and more uh, people of color, and so that's part of the reason we were interested in studying quarter real neighborhoods. I have a paper that I'm working on now uh, to submit, hopefully, to a journal. Um, and then we also, as I mentioned, asked self-rated uh, self health um, and several condition, health conditions, perceptions of crime and safety in, in one's neighborhood, um, attitudes and beliefs about immigration. So that's asking things like, are there too many immigrants um, in your neighborhood and businesses? Um, how much of the value when people don't speak English. Um, and then also we have really detailed demographic information, and this is more than we can get from the census. So things like LGBT identification, political party, and religion are not on uh, the census. So if we're interested in kind of trying to get an understanding of how those relate, then, um, then we can uh, look at those. Uh, the second survey was, was of the entire DC area um, and each um, and representative each of the jurisdictions except that we had to combine Fairfax and Alexandria into a single jurisdiction because there's just not enough people in Alexandria to, to survey um, and get a, a good estimate. So if you can go to one more slide. Um, and as I mentioned, the data are available. Um, we've gotten our first paper published. Uh, so this is in an academic publication, so the data are sufficient to get published. and so. Uh, this was by my colleagues Caldoun and Lewis in uh, Department of Public Administration and Policy. 
Um, and so if any of you are interested in the data, please let me know. It's uh, free to use, um, and, the, and it's good for me if people use it, because then we can advocate for it. The other thing is that there's ways, uh, one of the goals that the university was generously funded a lot of this work is that we are hoping to use this as preliminary studies for things like grants um, to NIH or NSF. Um, and so if you have any interest or if there's ways you want to combine with other you know, geophysical uh, type um, conditions, we have the census track location of all of the respondents as well. So we know where all of them live. Thank you. And now, Sonia. And I'll probably look at my notes to <laughs> keep me on the five minute track. <laughs> yeah, so um, my research has really evolved over the years to look at a lot of topics, but it's really at core <coughs> focused on target marketing, which is the core of marketing is how much in that if you identify a group of people that share some common interests or goals or needs or desires, then they will um, respond in a certain way if you serve them. So that's the basis really of marketing. And so my, um, much of my research has been nationally or internationally focused, but when I moved to DC uh, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, um, I really wanted to develop a project that was focused on where I live, work, and play. I also have a teacher community-based research course, uh, Marcy is part of Marcy's group, and um, we spend a lot of time doing work with local government agencies, so I'm exposed to a lot of different social issues. I teach the course every semester, it's called Marketing for Social Change, and every semester we work with one or more organizations in DC around different topics. So, um, but my inspiration for this first project focused on DC came from one night out dancing with my colleague Vanessa Perry, who's um, also a marketing <coughs> professor at GW. And uh, Vanessa and I were at U Street Music Hall. And we've been talking about developing the project for over 15 years. Um, so I met her when she was a doctoral student. And we were, I had just published a paper about diversity seekers, about people who proactively go out and look for diversity. They don't just, it's not about tolerance, it's not about um, those issues, it's about being really interested in diversity seeking. And Vanessa's research is on housing. Um, she, she worked at Freddie Mac, she studies housing, mortgage, um, mortgage dimensions, that kind of thing. So we're sitting there and we're looking around and noticing all this diversity, but the segregation within diversity. So there were all kinds of people at U Street Music Hall, but there were groups of black people, groups of white people, groups of Latinos, groups of Asians, um, you know, groups of Southeast Indians. It was just sort of, you, it was very clear this segregation. And so that really led us to this first um, project. And so what we wanted to do, if you could turn to the next page, is really think about um, this segregation within diversity is the issue that we wanted to look at. And so we decided to study three different neighborhoods. And if you look at the neighborhoods, you can see um, U Street, Corridor, Columbia Heights, and Petworth all have had significant changes in terms of income and demographic composition. So that was a big part of what we were looking at. Next one. And so we conducted a qualitative study to really understand how does gentrification and diversity, these changes that are happening in these neighborhoods, relate to consumption and social interaction. You know, because consumption is, is often very neighborhood driven, even though people go out of their uh, neighborhoods. And so we conducted interviews with both old and new residents in the three neighborhoods that I mentioned. We had a very diverse sample um, from 26 to 94 years old um, in terms of race, ethnicity, income, level of education, occupation, et cetera. And we asked people about diversity seeking, about how they felt in their neighborhood, um, use questions that relate to understanding a sense of community. And so what we found is that these gentrifying areas do indeed um, attract diversity seekers. So these are people who are like, I want to live, you know, someone said, I don't want to live, you know, downtown or by the monuments. I want to live where the riots were. Um, and a lot of this is very consistent with um, what Derek Hyra finds in his book that there's this excitement and um, attraction of diversity. 
Um, and that these demographic shifts, though, these changes in these neighborhoods result in tension. Tensions over everything from parking to the types of um, products that are available and the types of consumption opportunities, as well as the use of public mm -hmm. space. Um, and this whole, these tensions really reduce the sense of community. And what we developed was this whole idea that the lack of interaction reflects this notion of faux diversity. Mm. Um, is what we call this. Yes, there's diversity, but the diversity doesn't really mean anything if there's no interaction. I know people like the tout, like Columbia Heights is always touted as the most diverse place in Washington, <coughs> D.C. Um, and I will say that we, um, we did both an article as well as a movie. And the movie has had way more impact than the article. <laughs> We've shown the movie over 30 times. Um, we showed it a few weeks ago as part of the Smithsonian Right to the City exhibit. And there were supposed to be 15 minutes of Q&A, and it went over an hour. So that has been a way of sort of putting the research um, in a much more uh, accessible way. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, and there's a trailer if you're interested. Uh, you can just search dog parks and coffee shops on Vimeo, and you can see the trailer. I didn't bring a slide. But you could put up my uh, website for the Humanities Truck, which is just www.humanitiestruck.org. Um, so uh, I wasn't, um, I was told five minutes of storytelling. So I didn't uh, come quite as prepared, but I will tell you uh, what my work has been. Um, uh, certainly my focus has been and uh, my grounding has been in working with communities that are experiencing homelessness. Um, but really in order to understand the stories that, of, of their lives, uh, I'm an oral historian, uh, and so I do a lot of oral histories, but um, in order to understand those stories, I also spent quite a bit of time um, looking in um, the Washington Board of Trade records and uh, the city archives. and. Uh, really trying to understand um, uh, this kind of intersection between uh, the experience from below of neighborhood transformation, dislocation, dispossession, but also kind of where this came from. Um, one of my, uh, I, my first uh, 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 city that I really spent quite a bit of time researching and working in, uh, which uh, my, my book is about, is Cleveland, Ohio. Um, and, and the title, the subtitle of that book is uh, Homelessness and Urban uh, Development. Um, and so that's really kind of what I'm interested in is that intersection <clears throat> between uh, people in positions of power who have visions for how they want the city uh, to look and those um, who are uh, experiencing the city from, um, uh, uh, and I, I don't believe they're powerless by any means, but positions um, where um, uh, they experience um, uh, extreme poverty, uh, issues related to um, la lack of housing, et cetera, but also are trying to uh, create a space for themselves in the city. And, and to some extent, um, uh, in order to really, I think, understand some of these transformations, we have to understand both those sides because there's both that story of dislocation and dispossession, which I believe is far more profound uh, than I think is even commonly acknowledged. I recently was in the DC Public Library and came across uh, an, uh, a map uh, from 1961 of all of the urban renewal projects that were uh, uh, planned in 1961. And nearly all of them uh, correspond with these riot corridors that you were just talking about. Um, we spent on, on a, um, a related topic, I spent a semester with a group of students where we looked through every single property on U Street and 14th Street and tracked what happened to every single property uh, from 1960 uh, through 1975, and found that actually very little was damaged by the riots, that in fact most of the transformation had to do with um, real estate capitalism. Uh, and so to some extent, trying to figure out how does that, how do we tell that s story about kind of the urban planning that went in, and the intersection with uh, 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 real estate capital that went into the dislocation and really destruction of many neighborhoods. 
um, but at the same time not make that a totalizing story that also can can uh, uh, really speak to the ways in which communities have and still do to this day still persist uh, in these areas. Uh, how have they been able to do that? What are the ways, sources of resistance? What are the ways in which the plans didn't work out as intended, right? Um, those, those have kind of been really kind of the core questions. And so for me, I can get half the story in the archives. And even then, there's so much that's not there. Like, and I think if we look, even uh, now, I think it's getting even harder with all, um, we, we hear a lot about non-disclosure agreements with the, the Trump administration. But as I'm learning more frequently, anything really within the last 20 years is super difficult. We were working on a project on Mount Vernon Square, trying to understand how did Apple move in to Mount Vernon Square? Like, how did they get a hold of that? And um, that is, you know, it's, uh, no one knows, right? Well, some people know, but they probably all have non-disclosure agreements that have been signed. And so that, that, so there's a lot of ways in which I think we could potentially, I'm not saying we can't get those stories, but probably have to get those stories through oral histories and, and, and interviewing uh, and digging around. The other stories that we can't get to the archives are, are the stories of the people on the ground, right? So. Um, uh, uh, I will say we, we were able to, um, one of the things that I'm interested in, in terms of understanding urban renewal is how do neighborhoods come to be defined as dilapidated and distressed and blighted and what is the significance and meaning of that? Um, and, and that has a, a, at least a hundred year um, uh, history that are, are really, I think, going back to the late 19th century. And I think it, it, it's, it's uh, the shift in, in terms of how real estate value gets attached to um, questions of race and exclusion, right? Whereas, um, and this is still something I'm grappling with, and it's related to your research, actually, is how we go from a 19th century city where the wealthiest uh, a person in the city, Corcoran, can live on the same block as a woman um, who was working as a laundress, uh, who was African American, and and how do we move to then a situation where in the Upper Northwest, Reno City literally is demolished to allow for, uh, which was the predominantly African American area where Wilson High and and Deal um, Junior High School are, uh, which allows for the mortgage financing of all these white only single family homes that have racially restricted covenants on them uh, in the 1930s and, and 20s and 30s. Um, uh, so these, these, this is, there's this transformation that, that's taking place in terms of the very ways in which real estate markets work. So a lot of my interest has to do with um, Exploring, uh, obviously, I'm a historian, so I'm interested in history. But I am also very much interested in having uh, impact and grounding in communities. The truck project is really a, a way where we would, what I would identify as kind of a, um, a model of, uh, of research justice, where we, we we try and redefine who are the audiences, right? So, not only can I go and do research with uh, the city planning records, the you know the Washington Board of Trade records, but that rather than just producing reports about that, um, art academic articles, uh, or even go to the mayor's office and use that as, as some sort of model, bringing that out to the community where people can really think and reflect about what the meaning of this is for their communities, but then also use that as a means to rethink what are their stories because frequently people have access to very specific concrete knowledge, um, but don't necessarily have access to different knowledge that's outside of their experience. So how to bring those two together to really rethink. Uh, that's really what the idea behind the truck was, was both as a means, not only just to gather, collect, document stores, but also to bring information, uh, to work, um, to create new spaces where we can actually kind of reflect upon these na neighborhood transformations and really think through what, where we're going in the future. What, what can be done about all this? Where, you know, and, and how do we, 
how do we mobilize? What are the what are the sources of mobilization? Um, and really thinking also through about um, how do we kind of bridge different kinds of communities that don't necessarily talk to each other because we're always trying to speak to power, right? But not speak to each other. And so that's what I'm hoping the truck can do is start circulating between those different communities, bringing different stories uh, to communities that they wouldn't necessarily uh, think were, were the important community to talk to, but are actually neighboring communities that are experiencing very similar issues in a perhaps different way. Thank you. Thank you. Ben? I to see the screen. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, ben Stokes. I'm in the School of Communication. Um, and actually, Dan and I have been collaborating a little. Uh, it's the video that you're seeing here uh, of the truck is in Adams Morgan at Adams Morgan Day um, this past fall, um, which was the first time the truck headed up for a, a public showing. Um, we created a little humanities section, a kind of history section also, um, within Adams Morgan Day. So it's something that's a, a festival, uh, has music, it's about community engagement, it's also about commerce, people are buying things there, there are vendors, including um, photographers who are selling their work. But the question was, um, can this also be a space where we help bring some of the stories of the past to the uh, neighborhood in a new way, have more people engaging with that past? Um, and my work uh, often looks at how stories about neighborhood identity um, can be brought into visibility in new ways. Uh, and this matters partly because we know that things like gentrification aren't just the result of policy. Yes, policy matters. We, we like to think about policy, um, but this is actually going back to um, some of what, what Mike was talking about. And I'm really pleased to hear that the area survey um, is also looking at things like perception of crime, because it turns out perception has a huge influence on how neighborhoods change. Uh, it's not just the statistics like demographics and, and education and so on, but it's also perception. And perception is something that in a new media environment is tied into technology and tied into media. Um, it's not just at the national level where we worry about fake news in Russia. Uh, the same exact forces are affecting neighborhoods. Um, and I think that there's, I would, I would argue that the amount of attention that we're paying towards national uh, social media pressures, for example, is disproportionate. Um, there is just as much influence that is happening at the local level, um, but there are very few media scholars that are focused locally. And that's partly because our media scholars have historically been focused on mass media, and we've thought of this as just these broadcast systems that affect, that are powerful because they're affecting so many people at the same time. Um, but the paradigm of social media and participation means that it's actually not just one central broadcaster. It's not Facebook as broadcaster. It's Facebook as it's affecting how neighbors are talking to each other. Um, and so my work looks at um, how do neighbors talk to each other and engage with history in our civic institutions. Um, I have a grant right now um, from the Smithsonian and Custody Community Museum as part of their Right to the City exhibit um, to help bring that exhibit out to some of the neighborhoods um, that were covered. So a, a, a number of different neighborhoods, six different neighborhoods were, were, and, and some of their um, history in fighting for neighborhood change are, are profiled in this amazing exhibit, um, which will be reopening uh, in the fall. They're doing some construction in the museum. But while it's closed in the museum, uh, several different neighborhood libraries are hosting satellite pieces of the exhibit. Uh, which for me is a really exciting research opportunity because this is already taking the content out of the museum's walls. There are lots of people visit the museum, but a lot of people more visit their library in some ways, and it's often different people. Um, can we help bring some of that content to these neighborhood libraries? Um, and so uh, the Woodridge Library, the Mount Pleasant Library tied to Adams Morgan, um, the, uh, the Shaw Library, there, there are a number of different libraries. Each of them have these physical installations that are about you know, five feet tall, these series of interlocking panels. Um, and what's kind of cool is on the last panel, um, there's a, a place where it says, and if you have a story or you want to hear some of the uh, 200 plus oral histories that were, that were heard for this project, call our hotline. Um, and this is a little bit of how the physical and digital are starting to connect in alternative ways. So my work is partly looking at existing neighborhood communication ecosystems, but also doing design work. It's kind of from the, what can we build at the same time as what's there. And, and I think that that's that often that intersection that I think the future of neighborhood civic engagement is about. It's can neighborhoods build some of their own thing? Um, because right now, uh, a lot of communities are losing their local news. And we know that we know this from uh, just studies about how many local newspapers are shutting down. 
Um, yes, the New York Times is doing great. Washington Post doing great. We, we, newspapers are not going anywhere. Um, newspapers are not shutting down, but local news for the most part is what's being really uh, harmed. And we also know that when there's low, uh, uh, very little news engagement and people are not engaged in their community and are not turning out to vote, uh, it leads to all sorts of terrible governance uh, outcomes, democracy outcomes, civic engagement outcomes. So I, I think in some ways this is kind of a crisis and it's not a crisis that we can just study it's a crisis we have to experiment with making things. So my lab is making storytelling systems uh, as, as a way of doing this kind of research. One of the things we've got is old payphones that we are repurposing. Um, not because payphones are, are physically needed, everyone has a cell phone in their pocket, but the cell phone is a private personal device. And the thing about a, a payphone is it's, a, it's installed in space. Uh, it ties into that use of public space and the question of public stories and public good uh, comes very naturally when you have a physical installation. So we um, installed one of our payphones at the end of the exhibit uh, in the Anacostia Community Museum. Uh, you can go there at the end of the exhibit, you can pick up the payphone and, and hear some stories. We also have a mobile payphone, this kind of crazy thing. Uh, we actually wire it to a data plan, and use VoIP over it. It's a, it's a little bit of a strange thing, but we actually literally bring a payphone into uh, community events and people can hear, uh, pick it up and listen. They don't need to, they can call the same number from their cell phone, but the challenge is often how do we um, shift attention and engage with communities where they are and where they meet. Um, and so a lot of the work that, looks at, uh, the, that I'm doing looks at mapping where are communities already connecting and meeting. Uh, so we're doing a study right now in uh, Woodridge Brook, uh, in Brookland, uh, looking at how do uh, stories of civic history currently circulate? Um, how do local historians tie into local civic associations, tie into local media, often not newspapers, but things like blogs and listservs? Uh, and if those are all connected, then a neighborhood can start to tell its own story. Um, so this, the, the, the big picture, I think, for, for my work in DC is starting to map how do D, which DC neighborhoods have strong storytelling systems, uh, ecosystems in some ways for circulating stories. Uh, and this is a question that I think is really important in an age where new media is shaping civic engagement. Uh, and then what can we do about it? Can they design some of their own uh, storytelling systems and interventions, including with things like the truck, which I think is a great example of something that has a physical presence. It's, it's in physical space, but it also ties into archives. It brings things to, to light, it brings the visual and things like slides. Um, we're also designing games that might get people out onto physical streets, um, doing things like treasure hunts, finding, going to a particular location in order to release an audio story. Um, because the, the question for me is often about that participation. How can we get people, act, not just the content theoretically there, but more people participating and engaging with it. And I think that's a neat way in which we're bringing um, the AU Game Lab, um, which is one of AU's 2030 initiatives, back to things like metropolitan studies. Is there some connection between designing things um, and studying cities? I think this is the area that I'm exploring. All right. Thank you. Thank you all for, for that. Um, the common theme, obviously, that we've heard from many of you is, you know, gentrification and how this city is rapidly changing. Uh, but what I also heard everyone say is what does the city look, what's the future of the city um, as these neighborhoods are, are, are changing? And, uh, you know, I, I, I grew up east of the river, uh, which is predominantly African-American part of town. But that's rapidly changing. Um, and the stories are, 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 you know, how do those stories get told? Um, you made a great point about um, Prince George's County and the poverty rate is rising. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, is it because of the poor people in D.C. are now moving over to Prince George's County and things like that? Um, I'm going to actually turn it over to the audience because we're, we have about 15 minutes left. Um, so I want you guys to uh, ask any questions that you have of any of the panelists here. So feel free. Yes, please. Anyway. I know some of you do. <laughs> I, I can just say real quickly, uh, you know, the project um, that I, I briefly mentioned on U Street and 14th Street was uh, part of the scholars class where they, each of them had 20 pro properties that they had to track through a 15 year period. And um, uh, recently, uh, just this past um, uh, semester also with my scholars class, we were working um, on um, the Community for Creative Nonviolence uh, papers um, that are at GW, we, we met um, 
in their special collections and, and the students actually literally produced a exhibit that's going to circulate uh, between um, the shelter, the community for creative nonviolent shelter um, and various um, uh, drop-in center and mail sites that are, are downtown to really kind of think through what's that story, but it's also uh, a kind of starting point. It's a, uh, the one thing about the truck I like is it's iterative. It's there's never an end to it. It's the the end product is the beginning um, of gathering a new story. So, um, and then the same with this Mount Vernon Square project we we're working on. And I should say those are grad students, but also the Reno City uh, uh, project I was just mentioning was a project that um, some, some grad students were working on the truck with and had the truck on site. I have a class who is DC is one of these complex problems classes, so it's for freshmen. Um, <coughs> And the claim, that's when a lot of them are really excited to explore and get to know their city. And so in groups, I have them, well, we do a number of field trips to different parts of the city, um, but then their final projects are to develop uh, neighborhood identity profiles where they understand, they try to understand how neighborhood identity is kind of a complex construct that has some ambiguities and conflicts in it. With, and we actually pre-used the truck to present it as their final projects. We were out on the quad trying to, um, at each team were showing off different profiles of different neighborhoods that students might otherwise not get to see um, with the goal of trying to have student storytelling of neighborhoods not just be focused on the same places. Um, yeah. I just want to do a quick follow-up, but it is a challenge yeah. um, because it's easier for me to bring a group of 20 undergrad students uh, into the archives and I do think um, uh, many of them are, are really very interested and fascinating in this work. And it would be for me just to take them into a community meeting and say, okay, we're going to gather your stories because there's certainly, it's not always the case that the community thinks it's their stories that need to be gathered, right? And, and it's kind of a delicate uh, a dance working with, with community partners, um, as, you know, where you know, we to some extent want to know more about their experiences, but sometimes they say, hey, we don't want you to interview us, we want you to go interview the mayor, find out what the hell happened with the Apple's story, right? <laughs> or, um, and so um, sometimes it can be frustrating for the students, sometimes just the sheer presence of 20 people from the university, uh, I mean, obviously it's not sometimes, but always transforms, <laughs> transforms the community space, right? Yeah. So figuring out how to, to do that can be, be a challenge in a way that actually addresses the students' kind of needs to learn, but also the, 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 the actual constraints of trying to do things in an academic semester. Um, so it's, it's not easy. Yes, please. Uh, Michael, are you planning on the, uh, redoing the DC area survey for 2020? Yes, so our goal, the the project's goal is to try and get it so it's every two years kind of in perpetuity would be my like ideal goal. Um, we have enough funding so that we uh, will be conducting a survey in 2020. Um, so yes, yeah, so if anyone's interested. Um, but yeah, we're, we're looking for funding and partners now. One of the things that um, we're partic I'm particularly interested in is, is because we have this data, which is one of the, um, is, uh, when Amazon comes in, we have pre-data, not only pre-construction um, before Amazon comes, but we, should, we even have a pre-announcement. Um, and so one of the kind of pitches that we've made as we've worked on this project is we often don't know what kinds of changes are going to come, and so having data kind of systematically over time is really important. And so, um, so yeah, so hopefully we'll be able to convince someone with money that that's a good idea. That's fine. Um, I wonder if, if any of you can talk about partnerships that you've made with different community groups. I mean, it seems to me, like in my own work, it, it's really been about relationship building at school, at sites, obviously schools and education. But what what other organizations have you partnered with in order to do your research? Yeah. I guess I've partnered with Casey Trees again. That was kind of <coughs> a relatively easy one since I already worked there. <coughs> but even still, there was the it's just the it's a, a constant difficulty of uh, goal alignment of my goal when you know we get very specific about it is to 
do the re do good research and publish papers on it, and that doesn't directly align with Casey Tree's goal, even though you know they, they have a research branch, uh, if you will, as part of their organization. Um, so I was trying to figure out, okay, what what do they want from me? And I think what they want is interesting projects for their volunteers to work on. And what do I want from them? Well, I guess I would want the volunteers to be systematically collecting data in some kind of usable way. For instance, taking a picture of the tree in front of their house every week for a year. Um, so I, it's been a little bit of a dance to find those synergies, but I, I think that's working out. Um, my other partnership is with National Park Service, so I'm not sure that's quite as relevant, but it's kind of, they're, they're a little more um, engaged in a top-down top way. I, I'm sorry, I was just gonna say, for me, what, I feel like there are certain neighborhoods where it's pretty easy to find partners. Um, and I, I saw this in Los Angeles, too. Um, actually, part of my concern is the neighborhoods that don't have a lot of organizations to help out. Um, how, do we, how do we connect to those neighborhoods? There's a, there's a kind of like, um, poverty of associational life um, that if we um, can't engage in that way, it's not so the university then really has to build from, from zero. Um, and so I, my, my work is fairly easy when there's somebody else who's done the groundwork. There's a, an association, there's a library and, and a museum connection, and I can kind of build on that. Um, but if it's something where there aren't those things, that it would be uh, such an incredible cost to build up those relationships from, from nothing and almost help start some of those associations or connections. Uh, so that's an interesting like, question about the long-term connection between AU and the communities around it. Um, like, can we broker some of those that are longer term than any one research project? And I just want to add real quick, um, part of what was difficult for me was, I mean, this goes to the research side, is it was really hard to get, I mean, we have, I think 14 or 15 people now on the project, so just trying to get that was in and of itself a huge <laughs> effort, um, and all working <laughs> to get it all out on time. Um, and so, but another huge advantage that I, I realize now, being on the other side of tenure, um, before tenure, it was just, it was too hard to really, I mean, for me, I found, you know, trying to get that relationship on campus and the relationships off campus, I just didn't have enough hours in the day if I wanted to see my kids. And so, um, so I think that's something, you know, being novel. Now that I'm on the other side and the kind of publish, publishing doesn't need to come as fast, I've been able to spend more time doing that kind of work. Well, and as your kids get older, you'll want to spend less time with them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they're going to want to spend less they're time with you. Time yeah. With yeah. 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 <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, anyway, thank you all for what you're doing. And it's, it's quite interesting, especially because my office is trying to also figure out where these collaborations with different nonprofits exist mm -hmm. and how to when it is appropriate, get students more involved and when the conditions make that feasible. So I'm just curious, now with like this new AU strategic plan and emphasis of being a part, part of DC and mm -hmm. not apart from DC, like yeah. do you see the way you would approach your work as any different or, or new opportunities to do it and get strong support from the university, you know, in, in a variety of ways? Go, oh, yeah, please. Um, I would say one thing I've learned um, is if you do get a grant, um, in the process of applying for a grant is the time, um, usually, well, I, and I'm not an expert, I've just <clears throat> been success, pretty successful in the last couple of years, and, and that's not um, indicative of my skill by any means. But I will say one thing I've learned is when they come back after you, the first time I go in and I ask AU, hey, well, what are you gonna do to kind of match? They'll be like, well, nothing, because we're trying to get this money. That's the point, right? <laughs> and I'm like, okay, so then I put it out there, but none of the funders want to just give money if there's no AU commitment to kind of the long-term sustainability of what you're doing. And that's the time when they come back after your first draft, and they say, no, we need this, this, and this. They actually know that it, this is my time when I'm the grant writer to go to AU and say, okay, this is what kinds of commitment they need from us. And if there's a substantial pot of money that they're looking at, that's really your leverage point. And I found um, that, um, you know, AU is a great, you know, AU is, as an institution has been, been fantastic in terms of hiring 
all of us <laughs> to do the work that we do. Um, and, and that's, I think, something that's really incredible. Like one of the things that when I was playing on this truck, I realized, hey, I, you know, I'm just talking about my stuff, but I realized I'm not going to be using the truck every day. You know, there's going to be other folks who have great different kinds of community interactions that could benefit. And, and that's the hard part of it is to figure out how do we kind of build that, that um, what Michael is talking about, some of that kind of ways in which we can, we can really elevate each other's work, however that may be. And I think, um, I think it's hard for ADU, uh, but it's also, I don't feel there's a lack of commitment. I think to some extent this shift has is, is, is been beneficial. I, it's hard for me to necessarily say, if, because I feel like this shift came after a lot of the humanities truck stuff was kind of put in place and we fit well within that shift. Um, uh, and I feel like uh, some of it was because Honestly, back to the point you were saying earlier, funders realize we're in a crisis situation, and and they understand that we have to get out of kind of uh, this this. Um, we have to essentially figure out ways to um, expand dialogue, storytelling, uh, uh, reflection, uh, um, uh, and that that's. Um, so I don't know. I'm I'm not really. I'm not really sure. I, I, I do think it's um, going to be a, a somewhat of a challenge in figuring out when we actually are, when the actual meaning of what, what is these collaborations um, uh, entail. There are probably, there's going to be some form, I mean, if we're actually being effective and there's social change, then there's going to be social conflict. And we'll see then how Mayhew handles that. Right, and and that would be, I think, a good measurement in terms of the commitment towards social justice. Is if if the real estate development community gets upset at Michael's project because he's unearthed something, and and then communities are galvanizing around it, and they say, "What well, you've got to put an end to this." What say you going to do then? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I see myself as someone on the cusp of starting to do research in DC. So I'm interested in you making it very explicit for me. How does your AU affiliation impact or facilitate or make difficult this work in DC? Your own race and identity and your own geographical ties to DC. Give me the pitfalls or the possibilities. Yeah, I, um, I'm not a native Washingtonian. And so I think there is some challenge sometime with trying to make sure that you understand some of the issues from the, from the historical perspective of people who've been here for a lot longer and who know the neighborhoods a lot better, and that's a challenge. At the same time, being African American and studying neighborhoods, that's part of the reason I, we selected the neighborhoods we selected was not only because they are intensely gentrifying and different level sort of you know, first there's U Street, then there's Columbia Heights, and then there's Petworth, which was the darling at the time that we started our uh, research for the film. It was also because they were close to me, and so I could spend a lot of time there. And that was, to me, the biggest benefit of that, is that I could just, I would go to breakfast, <coughs> and I'd find my, and I'd keep my camera in my pocket, and I'd find myself interviewing somebody. Um, it wasn't planned, it was just, everything was very sort of serendipitous because I was constantly in the neighborhood. You know, the idea came at U Street Music Hall. I go to lot street festivals all the time, Adams Morgan's Day, etc. so I'm constantly out. I mean, I have tons of footage even though I'm not a filmmaker. Um, it was just being in the neighborhoods really was my primary benefit, I think, around that. And just walking around now, I get other ideas just from stopping and talking to people. I was going to say that I think that um, I, from my research, it feels uh, there are a lot of places where AU is seen as the white, rich institution on the hill, yep. a little removed. And I feel like that's worth like saying and talking about with community partners. And I kind of position that as a problem that we want to do something better about. And this goes back to the strategic plan. I feel like, oh, look, the administration's actually interested in doing something about this. Uh, and this is a moment of opportunity. Um, and we don't have to do engage. 
but if we want it to, to, uh, to engage, if, and, and communities want us to engage, I think there can be opportunity in multiple directions if we start having that conversation. So I think it's a, much, it's a hard time to do research on neighborhoods. It's a great time to do research with neighborhoods. Um, so if you kind of go and, and ask, well, what could, what could we do with you? How could I support what you're already trying to do? So, which is the work I tend to do, and I find it's not a very, it doesn't, I haven't felt like a hard sell so far. Um, even with some of the stuff with my class for freshmen, we're asking, interviewing residents, what do you think AU students should know about this neighborhood? It's, as, it, then they get to say, oh, people think this, but it's actually that. Um, and then it's less of me like extracting data and more of me um, helping move stories in ways that feel part of strategy that people want uh, from, from their neighborhoods. Uh, and in that sense, I feel like being, a, uh, being connected here, and, and I don't, I'm not from here, uh, but I want to connect. And so that, that, I think that, that's, that in that sense echoes where I think AU should be, is AU can say it hasn't actually been well connected to a lot of parts of the city, but this is a moment where it can want to be. Yeah. So if I can jump in real quick, I, I know we're running short on time, but um, so all, uh, all my colleagues here are focused more on the, the kind of uh, neighborhood level. I've been more kind of at the government and kind of uh, uh, nonprofit level. And there, my AU affiliation has been really beneficial. I don't know how much that's because I'm white and male, and that you know certainly gives me some you know unearned credibility walking in. But um, but I do think that there's a certain amount of respect and understanding that the the um, institution brings, and so that's been helpful for me to be able to come in and say we're we're doing this. We're top-notch, nationally known researchers. I think that the fact that the, I mean, I'm, um, I also serve as the associate director of the Metropolitan Policy Center. I think having that here really helps because I think that people know that we're studying the metro area and that's something that's really a focus at AU. And if you're interested in that, I'd be more than happy to talk to you about how to get more involved in that. And, and Derek um, and the folks at, I mean, all of you, I think, are affiliates. Um, as well, um, all have connections, and so that's that's another way that it's really helpful being here. Is you know I, I can connect to neighborhoods if I want to, or um, and present the data and, and everything. So, and I, I would just add on to that that both um, both of your comments really highlight that AU is not one place, mm -hmm. and the perceptions will really differ depending on the stakeholders. Like honestly, when I'm on the ground, I don't say I'm in the business school at all because people don't think about community engagement from the business school, they think about business engagement. Mm -hmm. And so actually when I was doing the film and the research, I never told anyone at the business school. I actually never told anyone what I was doing. <laughs> I, was, uh, I just did the research and once the film came out and you know, and they saw all the interest in it, that there was this interest in community from a business perspective, I think that had an impact there in ways that wouldn't have come otherwise I, think, I mean, I think it's a very important uh, question. Who are we, why, who, why are, who are we to do the work that we're doing? Um, uh, it's certainly, I've, you know, I've, um, I uh, dress as a white man, tall, uh, go out in the community. I, I actually um, uh, experience, uh, uh, experience homeless. I've been working on homeless issues since 94, three, four. And uh, I've experienced homelessness, um, and uh, am very comfortable in situations with a lot of people who are experiencing homelessness because of this kind of long history. But, but at the same time, I recognize, acknowledge my my experience within that has been very different than other people's experiences within that, and so to some extent, I kind of instead of trying to pretend I am one of you, right? I, I literally perform the white professor from AU, like with my jacket, et cetera. But I, at the same time, um, there are, and there are ways in which, I mean, it's complicated. I don't, um, uh, I think it does uh, create uh, a complicated relationship that would be hard to just necessarily um, uh, 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 simplify too much in terms of, um, um, there's a degree of distrust. There's probably also, even in the uh, community among the unhoused, there's probably some extent of, okay, there's a legitimacy here because AU is interested in this. AU has very little history in a lot of this stuff, which both it can be helpful as well as like, who, who is AU? We all know Georgetown, we all know GW. Who are you to come in here? 
the same time, AU, one of the things I found is AU's library, of just admitting people into the library without having to require is, is actually something people notice. And I've heard that. But I've also worked with people who've been escorted and banned from campus for being a homeless and house about them. They're probably, probably working on something they shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> At the same time, um, this creates um, this, uh, uh, I, I feel like uh, the issues are so fundamental, right? right? Like in terms of, of people are literally dying on the streets. And if, if I didn't need to do this and there was some other thing that people were, you know, there were so many people working on this that I didn't have to work on it, then I could find something else to work on. But I, I think people appreciate the fact that I care, really ultimately and and for me it's like what are my actions and how do i live up to my promises and how am i most transparent like with with what i'm trying to do that they can measure me based on what i'm saying i'm going to do and what i'm delivering uh at the same time acknowledging i am who i am i come with my privileges and my uh and my outsiderness i'm not from dc uh i was you, you, you know, but I, you know, you know, there's certain ways in which, which what I do just kind of helps build the trust. And so, I mean, I, I guess, I don't think, I think in any community, I mean, it's even within our own families where we're ultimate insiders, we have to continue to build trust and, and relationships, right? So, so that, that's to me, um, uh, you know, something I, I try, I try and do, and I, I, I think um, I'll just say one last thing about sure. that. I'm going. I was invited to go. Uh, I haven't quite yet said it. Um, to the 90th birthday party of Allison Stoughton Lind, and they're um, really the two people who put doing oral history of people who are from below on the map. Uh, Stoughton Lind uh, directed the Freedom School during the Mississippi Freedom Summer. And um, their whole their whole birthday celebration is who are we to even do this work, right? Like what? That's the question they're asking. But rather than have that be a pro, uh, a question that causes paralysis, trying to figure out and think through that question and work through how do we do it ethically, and and um, and that I think is is what keeps us hopefully honest about what we're, we're trying to do and, and also helps us recognize our feelings and our um, valuability, et cetera. But, All right. Are there any more questions from the room? We have about five minutes left. Yeah. Um, I'm Catherine Ray, and I work in the library, so I get a lot of your students. Mm -hmm. And gentrification is one topic, and Ben's already heard my story, so sorry, but, um, you know, so the kids have amazingly short, not amazing, they're only 18, 19 years old, but mm -hmm. they can only see, it seems like they think D.C. history started with the riots, mm -hmm. and when I try to tell them things like Anacostia High School was the white high school, they don't believe it, you know, um, I say my father was born on the family farm at 2nd and Madison Streets Northwest which is east of the park. You know, my mother's family didn't come here until 1914, but my grandmother lived in the same house on Longfellow Street until she was too old to live there, and she was the last white person on the block. So sort of I saw the whole Brightwood neighborhood change from being a white neighborhood to being a black neighborhood to being now my children's friends are living there, which is highly amusing to me. Um, but I also worked at the Martin Luther King Library in the 1980s, and I saw my professional African-American colleagues by droves moving to Bowie and taking their D.C. government salaries to Maryland. And our city was hemorrhaging. And this is a story that needs to be told, too. It's part of the conversation. Neighborhoods in D.C. always, ch always changed. So it wasn't like this monolithic one thing and then became something different and then became something different. And I, 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 it kind of hurts my heart that some of that's being forgotten. And, and 
how do we help students define what a historically black neighborhood is? Is that a neighborhood that became black in the 1960s? Because for them, that's like World War I was to me. You know? <laughs> this is like ancient history. But it's also important for them to know that life didn't begin in 1968 in the city. And there were neighborhoods that were truly historically African-American. I mean, that's where they lived. And, and I think we're getting a little bit mixed up with what is what in the city. And I don't know how your research can help me help the students. Neighborhood change is not new. Yes. So one thing that I just want to mention, this is less on research, but I um, is teaching, I teach a class on urban sociology, and the students are always really upset to learn that there's one week on gentrification and 13 weeks on other things. And, um, and I make them go, one of the projects I assign is I make them go out to the suburbs. I don't let them, so they do some kind of community type thing, but I make them, I put it on the um, metro line so they all have metro passes um, so they can all get there. But the, you know, they go to Wheaton, they go to uh, Reston, they go, you know, and so one of the things is just encouraging them to learn about places out. I mean, this is why, like, I think that focusing just on the district is really problematic, especially for the kinds of, of trends that you're talking about, middle class African Americans going to Bowie, to Jessup, to the kinds of places that, you know, were really prevalent in the 1980s and 1990s, especially as crime was really high in the district. Um, and so, and, and talking about those trends, I think, is, is really trying to get them to think outside of the district as, like, these boundaries that are just here. Um, and so that's, that's my pitch, is really trying to get them to understand the suburban history as well. Um, because I think that also, I have found, helps me with the research-wise, help if I can say, look what's happening in Silver Spring right now, right, with kind of the same kinds of gentrification and, and turnover. So, you know, you can kind of trace within the last 30 years, you know, it was all white and then it was mixed race and now it's becoming all white again. I think that helps them kind of get a sense of what's going on. And there are oral histories there. People have seen all three of those, those stages. So that's, that's my, my pitch. One, one of the things when I worked on this CCMB project that's on a website, <clears throat> would actually help give um, me the impetus for creating the truck. Um, it's called whosdowntown.org. Um, we took that around, that was our first exhibit on the truck, and um, the residents at the shelter were actually most interested in the story about how the alley, how the building itself was part of an alley dwelling clearance movement um, that really was, uh, had its roots in the 1930s, and the building was, uh, that community was cleared, and the building was built in 1940, right? And the story of how that building was constructed had been completely transformed by by everybody. That it was everyone had said it was a temporary war structure that outlasted its time. Um, that it was meant to be kind of barracks, but in fact, it was the headquarters for the Reconstruction Finance Corporation and used to be the headquarters for the Security and Exchange Commission. But but when we did our project this semester on Mount Vernon Square. They, they were the ones saying, we want to know that earlier story. And I will say, it's not just our students. I mean, the media, the, uh, the policy, uh, people who do policy. I mean, I was kind of joking a little bit, like, you know, about the title of our, our panel is, you know, this is not a new, you know, I've been hearing this since I arrived on the previous pro provost. I, you know, our provost is great. I don't want to say anything for him, but, but I don't, he might think that this is a new idea, but this is definitely not. Um, this is, you know, the same kind of thing, but this is the same thing we see in development. Uh, these new ideas were transform, um, transforming um, this neighborhood, and people don't even know that they're this neighborhood that they're transforming was slated to be transformed in the way that they're transforming it in 1961. Mm -hmm. Right? It's like privatizing Metro. If anybody's been around long enough, they remember Oroid Chalk and uh, DC Transit. It was a private failure. <laughs> so yeah. The government had to take it over. But that's what I'm just going to say look, one last thing. But we did on Mount Vernon Square, the thing we discovered was the actual construction of the Carnegie Library was a product of a period of gentrification that really was a culmination that went from 1880 to, uh, to about 1910, where that neighborhood was completely transformed from kind of a working class 
immigrant uh, African American neighborhood into kind of a, a, a wealthy part of, of Washington, D.C., that then gets transformed again in the uh, teens and 20s to becoming a predominantly African American neighborhood, right? So, and that has to do with transformation of real estate finance and the rise of the Federal, federal Housing Administration. And the lack of voting rights. Yep. Lack of voting rights in the district. Son. Yeah, well, in, in that case, I, I honestly think it's about how homes are bought and purchased more than voting rights. But there are the voting rights story is important. But in this case, it mirrors what happens all across the country um, uh, and has to do with how mortgage finance takes place. Okay. I want to let Sonia make the last point because then we're going to have to wrap I'm just up. I'm going to put a plug in for something that Marcy mentioned in terms of finding ways to aggregate what's going on on campus. May would really, I think, help students to a large degree. Um, you know, when you think about, we're all looking at you know different pieces of the elephant, and you know, I always think back to I had written a case on UPO based on a project that my students did with UPO. I didn't know that Jane Palmer's group of students were working with UPO the next semester. I mean, there were, and there might have been a way to build on the classes mm -hmm. working together. Um, I had an experience where I worked with a, my class, social marketing, met with a class in philosophy about the environment. We were going to talk about marketing the environment. And there was so much conflict over basic premises and assumptions. But afterwards, the student evaluation said both students, they really liked it. Like the philosophy students were like, marketing, this is evil. It's the business school. The business students were like, what are they talking about? Um, but they really all really rated it very well. Um, it was Evan Berry's class. And so I think there's an opportunity for us to bring together a lot of these issues under, in terms of community engagement so that there is more synergy around these things, which will benefit the students as well as benefit our research. OK. Well, thank you all. We are out of time. Thank you for, to all the panelists. Thank you.